Welcome to Nursing School Explained in this video on heart valve disorders. Pretty much we have to distinguish between two different types of disorders here and those are stenosis and regurgitation. In heart valve stenosis there is a problem with the opening of the valve which can be due to a narrowed valve and this can be a variety of reasons but also congenital and then there can be calcium deposits. So as we age, more calcium deposits in our arteries or in our blood vessels, also making the blood vessels stiffer. And a cardiologist once told me that the older we get, the more likely we're going to get these calcium deposits and um, have stenosed valves. And the most commonly stenosed valves is the aorta. So aortic stenosis is a very common disorder. As you can see over here, I highlighted in red the O from stenosis as well as the O of the opening. This is something that I like to remember. So stenosis is a problem with the opening. That way you can kind of relate this back. Now the second problem that can happen with a heart valve is regurgitation, which is a problem with the closing of the valve and sometimes referred to as insufficiency or incompetence. So now when the heart valve is stenosed, it basically, if it would um, typically open up this way, when there are calcium deposits, the, the valves get more stiff and the leaflets can't really open. Where in regurgitation, the, there's a problem with the closing. So now when the valve closes, it might not close all the way or one side might close more than the other. So there's a problem with the closure. And really, if we look over here at the anatomy of the heart with our right and left side, on the right side of the heart, we have the tricuspid and the pulmonic valves. And then on the left side, we have mitral and aortic valves. And either way, whether the valve is stenosed, not opening all the way, or regurgitating, meaning not closing all the way, the blood flow will be not as smooth as it would usually be. And then what occurs is that the blood will kind of back up into the previous chamber. So if there's a problem with the pulmonic valve, then the blood will could back up into the um, right ventricle and then into the right atrium. And the same thing could happen on the left side. And if we think about that, usually in our blood vessels, the blood flow happens pretty steadily and kind of like at a straight flow. But if there is any kind of obstruction happening, so now if that valve is not opening or not closing, that blood flow is going to leak through because the valve is supposed to be closed, but the blood is going to leak through and kind of cause a turbulence here. And this turbulence that we can, that occurs here, we can hear that with our stethoscope, which leads us to over here, signs and symptoms. So many times the first sign of a valve problem is an audible murmur that somebody detects maybe on a routine physical or during some sort of an exam where all of a sudden mm, there might be a little bit of a murmur here, which is that turbulent blood flow as the blood leaks through the valve, whether it's not opening or not closing appropriately. The most common heart murmurs are aortic stenosis and mitral regurgitation, just for your information. And then as things, as the blood flow through the heart doesn't occur in the normal anatomical way, and there is that, black, that back up, signs and symptoms of heart failure will develop depending on where the valve is that is affected. And you probably already know signs and symptoms of heart failure. So left-sided heart failure typically backs the fluid back up into the lungs and resulting in shortness of breath and crackles. Those are the most significant symptoms, but the patient might also have signs and symptoms of angina as well as syncope present with dysrhythmias and or complain of palpitations. Now, when the valves on the right side are affected, the fluid will back up into the body, causing weight gain, edema, JVD, as well as hepatosplenomegaly in significant or, or severe cases. 
Um, and then looking at the diagnostic tests here. So an echocardiogram, that ultrasound of the heart will give us a better idea of the heart valves. Are they closing appropriately or may maybe they are regurgitating the some blood flow when they're supposed to be closed. And it's a very nice test also to give us an indication of the size and the blood flow through the heart valves as well as the, the chambers um, of the heart. Certainly a chest x-ray would be a very important test to see if there's enlargement of the heart, so cardiomegaly from maybe more advanced heart failure. A stress test will test the heart under stress, so either medication induced or exercise induced to see how much worse does the heart valve perform with um, under stress. A cardiac catheterization might be needed to take a closer look inside to kind of evaluate the patient for angina and dysrhythmias and maybe take a closer look at the valves um, right there inside the chambers. And certainly CTs and MRIs can be indicated to evaluate the valves in more detail. Now treatment for heart valves is treatment of heart failure because that is the signs and symptoms that we're going to see. So those include all those medications that we also treat patients with heart failure with, ACE inhibitors, angiotensin receptor blockers, ANRIs, angiotensin neuroleptin receptor inhibitors, which is a, a kind of like a brand new drug class that's been evolving in the treatment of heart failure, as well as diuretics to deal with all that fluid that's cracking up. Now when the valve gets significantly impaired, then sometimes valve replacement is required. And there are always new technologies and new methods of how to do this, so please read up in your book and see whatever the last or the latest version is for valve replacements. But typically there are two different ways of doing this, which is the valve can be replaced with a mechanical valve or a tissue valve that would come from a cadaver or maybe an animal such as a pig. And when there's a mechanical valve, the patient after valve replacement will need to be on anticoagulants for life because there's a high risk that um, things will attach to this valve, such as platelets and other um, coagulation factors and kind of stuff that helps us with our immune response because it is a foreign body. And so the mechanical valves are at higher risk for developing clots or even just developing growth and then the valve again will be impaired. Where with tissue valves, typically the anticoagulation is only needed for about six months post-op and then the patient can come off the anticoagulation. Of course, they'll need close follow-up and monitoring. But either way, whether it's mechanical or tissue replacement, um, the valve, they both need to be, or both of these types of patients need to be on prophylactic antibiotics for dental work because there is a risk that bacteria could get into the bloodstream from the dental work and then it could basically latch on to the artificial or the replaced valve and that could lead, lead again to problems and, and, and severe complications and maybe even malfunctioning of that heart valve. So those are very important things to do, these prophylactic antibiotics, and this is something that likes to come up on exams as well. Now as for nursing care, certainly um, if we're caring for a patient that we know has a known valve disorder, or maybe that will undergo or has undergone valve replacement, we'll need to monitor the vital signs very carefully, as well as have them on telemetry to see any kind of dysrhythmias that are occurring. We will have to pay close attention to their cardiovascular system and monitor them for all these signs and symptoms of heart failure or peripheral circulation impairment. Then because we know that it's heart failure related, we need to monitor the patient's daily weight as well as, well as eyes and nose very carefully to monitor their fluid status. And then teaching is always a very important part of the, no, the nurse's responsibilities. And the more we can teach our patients about their medications that they need for treatment, such as these for heart failure, the more compliant the patient will be. And besides the medications for treatment, 
We also need to emphasize the need for the prophylactic antibiotics and for the patient to share this information with their dentist so that they can be aware as well. And then the need for anticoagulants, because as you can imagine, a lifelong need for anticoagulants in patients with mechanical heart valves, that can be, there can be some compliance issues because of some concerns the patient might have, or maybe forgetfulness, or maybe they don't think it's necessary anymore. So this teaching here, um, as with many topics in nursing, is very, very important. So thank you for watching this video on heart valve disorders and the difference between regurgitation and stenosis. Please also watch the other videos, specifically the one on heart failure, to kind of refresh your memory on what that all entails, how it develops, and um, signs and symptoms that you might see. Thanks for watching. See you soon here on Nursing School Explained.